number 51, Psalm number 51 this morning. I'd like to share a message with you this morning entitled, David's Darkest Hour. Psalm number 51. Also, you can find Psalm 51 and also find 2 Samuel chapter 12. And you can go ahead and stick your birth certificate in that page or your four-leaf clover or whatever it is you have in your Bible. Hold that spot. We'll go over there in just a couple of minutes as well. But this will be the conclusion of the three Psalms that I told you that I would preach on. And Psalm 49 through 51. And, you know, both of them are uh, lead up to this Psalm, I believe. And we saw in Psalm 49 how the psalmist called the entire world to attention and uh, had a message from God to be delivered. And we saw where it didn't matter who you were. It mattered only that you had to pay attention to what God was getting ready to say. And uh, remember we talked about the low and the high, the rich and the poor. God called Psalm 49. He called everyone to attention there for a message that was important. And the message was this. Don't rely on material things to get you through. Focus on God because He's the only one that can do it. And then in Psalm number uh, 50, last week we preached about God calling His people uh, to attention. And basically He gave a warning on the evils of uh, hollow worship and practicing religion rather than relationship. And uh, gave us a good warning about that. And so today we'll move on to Psalm 51. And most folks know this psalm. It's a very familiar one. It's the psalm that David wrote when he had sinned with Bathsheba, and uh, we want to talk about that this morning. But I wonder this morning, how many of you have taken a walk, and then as you're walking along, everything's going well, the sun's shining, nice day, and all of a sudden you feel something on the bottom of your foot, and it begins to hurt. And you walk along a little further, and it hurts a little bit more, and then you realize... You've got something in your shoe. And most often it's one of those little tiny rocks. And it seems to always work to the place where it hurts you most when every time you take a step. Has that ever happened? Every one of us has a story like that, I'm sure. But you know, oftentimes what do we do? We just continue to walk with hopes it'll go away. And then eventually what happens? We have to stop. And we have to either sit down or stand on one foot so we don't get our sock dirty as we take our shoe off and dump out the rock. But this morning I want to relate that to what happened here with David in his life. And as we see things unfold in uh, Psalm number 51, David was in a kind of a place like this. And so if we're honest this morning, we could probably relate to David in the fact that every one of us uh, has had times in our life where we knew that we had unconfessed sin in our life. And rather than deal with it right off, and like David was saying this morning, as a matter of fact, quickly, we sort of just let it sit there. And uh, it affects us. It affects our countenance. It affects a lot of things about our walk with the Lord. And we just kind of think that eventually it'll go away and it'll pass. But David gives us a great example this morning uh, in our Bibles about how we're supposed to deal with this. And if we were to go through our Bibles from cover to cover and pick out the most interesting character in the Bible, uh, I wonder who each of us would choose this morning. But for today's message, I've chosen David because I believe he would be at the top of most folks' list as the interesting character that God worked with. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13, I told you to go to 2 Samuel. I'm just going to read a couple of verses. You don't need to turn there if you don't want to. But 1 Samuel 13, verses 14 through 15, says this about David. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. David is, or excuse me, Saul is the one being talked about here by Samuel, but he's getting ready to say this about David. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And that's David. 
And he's getting ready to be God's anointed king of Israel after Saul's departure. And the Bible says, And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee, speaking of Saul. You know the story. God was sending the message through Samuel, uh, the prophet, to alert Saul to the fact that he would no longer be king. You know, Saul was... Saul's life was a life of selective obedience to God's commands. And because of this, the world is still suffering today in many places because of Saul's unwillingness to take God at his word. Did you know that it was Saul who indirectly is responsible for the Muslim terrorists of today? Saul was told by God to deal with that situation then, and he didn't do it. And so consequently, we have a rising nation of Islam and Muslim faith around our world, and everywhere that it is, there's always turmoil and all kinds of other things going on, and people say, well, you know, the Muslim faith is a, you know, they're a, they're a kind and, you know, gentle people, and they love the Lord and all this other stuff, but can I tell you, those are not the ones we need to worry about. We need to worry about the fundamentalists in the Muslim faith. They're the ones that are responsible for much of the terrorism in our world today. And so we have to be careful, but that's a sermon for a different day. But today I want to focus on Psalm 51 and what David did to get back into fellowship with his God. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he was out of fellowship. You know, today the truth is most of our prayers, if we're honest this morning with ourselves before God, most of our prayers mine and yours, oftentimes do not penetrate the ceiling. Why, you say, because all too often we have unconfessed sin that we've allowed to stay in our life and uh, we've tried to sweep it under the rug and a, a rock in our shoe if we just simply put up with it, you know, like we think it'll eventually go and we just don't deal with it the way we need to. It's critical for us to deal with our sinfulness quickly and promptly if we're going to keep our relationship with God the way it needs to be. In Psalm 51, we see David's prayer of confession. And uh, it was a, uh, a confession to God for the sins he had committed against Bathsheba and all of the others that were involved. We, you know, we think of Bathsheba, but this sin led to a lot of other people being damaged and hurt by David's actions. You know, if the Lord's Prayer is in the Gospels is an example of how we're supposed to pray, David's Psalm 51 is an example of what to do if we find ourselves out of fellowship with God because of our sin. This is David's darkest hour in the Bible, I believe. And, you know, David had forgotten Joseph's example of what to do when you're enticed by a beautiful woman. You know the story. Joseph was there in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife tried to, uh, to seduce him, and the Bible says he, f he fled we, without his garment, as a matter of fact. He just got away from there, and David, unfortunately, didn't follow that good example that had been set years before. And when we think of David's life, we would do well to realize and, and, and understand that David was a faithful man to God for most of his life and throughout most of the history of David. He was faithful. David's life was an example of, of how to honor God by keeping his commandments. Save only his sin with Bathsheba and the events that followed it. 1 Kings Chapter 15 and verse 5 gives us a testimony about David's faithfulness where it says, Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything, that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Remember, Uriah was Bathsheba's wife, or excuse me, husband. <laughs> Sorry. Crazy, huh? Uh, and so when we look at Psalm 51... It also addresses David's sin with Uriah as well as uh, the sin with Bathsheba. And David illustrates for us in Psalm 51 three, uh, three critical ingredients necessary for biblical repentance. Number one, first of all, in verses 1 through 6, look with me in Psalm 51. The Bible says in verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me uh, 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 throughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil thing in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in in sin, and did my mother conceive me? Behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. First of all, David confesses his sin to God. He acknowledges God's tender mercy, his loving kindness, his ability to blot out our sins. Uh, and, and if we're to get right with God, we also must confess. You say, well, pastor, everybody knows that. It isn't that we don't know it, it's the matter we don't do it. Many times we don't do it. We see David here has clearly fallen and he knows that he's fallen, but let me tell you, he was not cast down by God. He was fallen, but not cast down. You know, you may be here this morning and you have a secret sin in your life right now, today. On July the 19th, 2020, you, you, you may have a sin in your life right now that you're trying to hide. And can I tell you, God knows about it. You may think no one else knows, but God knows. But the good news is this, you're not cast down by God. You may be out of step with God and out of fellowship, but uh, you're not lost if you're a Christian this morning. And He stands ready to forgive you and make uh, your, your conscience whole again. David acknowledges in verse number 2 of our text that he has a need for complete cleansing. Complete cleansing. Notice verse 2, it says, Wash me uh, throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now in verse 2, there's a word there that talks about complete and full cleansing. It's the word throughly. If your Bible says thoroughly, it has been tampered with by the publishers. It may be a King James Bible, but it's been tampered with by the publishers, and it's been changed to the word thoroughly. And if you do a word study on this verse here in our text, and you look at the root Hebrew word, you're going to find that it is a different word for the word throughly or the word thoroughly. But in our text, it is the word throughly. Now, you can do what you want with your Bible, but I'm just simply telling you, we have to be careful because all Bibles are not alike. The same thing we find in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 17, where the Bible says that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Same situation there. But here in our text, the root word is translated throughly. And it has a meaning of many or great. What's the point? David was probably say, or was, was saying basically this, that he knew he had many sins. A great number, which is signified by that word throughly. And David knew he needed a complete and throughly, or a through cleansing, I should say, of every wicked thing that he had in his life, even those things buried deep under the surface. And I use the example of water oftentimes to describe these two words. The difference between the two words of thoroughly and throughly. If I go into a pool and I come out, I'm going to be uh, thoroughly wet. But if I go into that same pool and I drown, I'm going to be throughly wet. Inside and outside. Sinfulness must be dealt with at the root. And every one of us knows we've got far more sin in our life oftentimes than what we're willing to admit. And I'm saying to you this morning, we've got to get it all out of there. Amen? You say, well, pastor, that's just not possible in the world we're living. It is possible through Christ. We can deal with our sin. God has provided a way for us to do that. And, and we know that we'll not, uh, we're not going to end up in hell because of our sin, because of what Christ has done. If you're saved today, you're going to heaven regardless of what you do between now and the time God calls you. But we can be out of step and out of fellowship with God if we're not careful and we don't deal with our sin. 
In verse number 3, David gives us a great example. Look there, verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Notice he says, uh, he gives an example and he makes an acknowledgement. You know, that's our biggest problem most of the time. We just won't acknowledge that we have something that we shouldn't have. David makes this decision and he tells God, he says, I acknowledge, he said, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. It was wearing on him. It was wearing him down. It's like the rock in your shoe. It was just beginning to keep hurting more and more. And, and he just, before long, it was, it was you know, getting his attention and he just couldn't uh, put it off anymore. And he's going to come to the place that he needs to come to. And we're going to see that in just a minute. But we just need to simply honestly acknowledge our sins before God. And we would do well to, to get it done sooner rather than later. Verse 4, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when they speakest and be clear when thou judgest. You know, this shows us clearly before we ever sin against anyone else, it's God that we're offending first of all. Every sin we commit is a sin against God first. It's a sin against the Word of God, uh, the Bible, the ways of God that we've been instructed in, and the things that God has asked us to do. When we sin, we are offending a holy God with our sinfulness. By the way, every sin that we commit should be acknowledged as what it says here in this verse, where it says, it is done, and done this evil in thy sight. Sin is an evil thing. And sometimes we, we make sport of our sin. Make jokes about it even. But God sees it as an evil thing. And we should see it the same. David realizes that God is justified to convict us as he pleases when we sin. In other words, the Spirit's conviction comes on us when we sin. And, and that's for the purpose so that we can get it right. And all too often we just simply push it aside. But David tells us and shows us here with his actions that that's not the way he's going to handle it. Number, verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. You know, years ago, Catholic Church taught that when children are conceived, their parents were in sin during the process, and so they needed to have that original sin dealt with. That's just craziness. Having a child in marriage is God's gift. It's not sinful. And David is not saying here that when his parents conceived him, it was a sinful practice. No, what David is saying is uh, that a husband and wife can produce a baby without sinning. And he is acknowledging himself being born in Adam's image in that sinful state is what he's saying. David had the ability to sin just like you and I. And he was no different than you or I. He was a man and, and he had the ability to sin just like what we do. And he was acknowledging that fact. Verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. David acknowledges God's requirement of truth. Truth is our responsibility with regard to our sin. God knows the truth. And sometimes we think we're going to put one over on him by not telling the truth, and that's just silly. We're not going to. God knows about our sin before we even commit the sin. He knows what we're thinking he knows what we're going to do next. He knows uh, how to deal with all of these things. And, and so to think that God is going to be uh, put over, we're just crazy to think that. I ask you to turn to 2 Samuel. Turn over there, 2 Samuel, with me just for a minute, if you would. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Here we find the story of David and Nathan, and Nathan confronting David for his sin. And Nathan confronts David in verse number 1, it says, The Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children, and did eat of his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom. And was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock.
uh, and of his own herd uh, to dress uh, for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man. And so David, Nathan is unfolding this story to David. And you see in verse 5, it says, David's anger was greatly kindled because he kind of assumed that Nathan was telling him a story of something that had happened in somewhere in the kingdom and he was concerned and David even makes the statement, well, I'm going to get to the bottom of this thing now and let's find out who did this thing and we'll take care of that. Bible says in verse 6, uh, uh, and, and no pity, David was angry, but in verse 7, Nathan says this to David, he says, thou art the man. Can you imagine what must have gone through David's mind at that very moment when Nathan said to him, Thou art the man. Nathan puts his finger squarely on David and says, You're the guy. You're the guy I'm talking about. You're the one. And Nathan's indictment at least comes at least nine months after the sin had been committed. So this had been going on for quite a period of time. We know it's at least nine months because Bathsheba was with child and we know all the other things that take place before this happens. And so as we look at this, David walked with that rock in his shoe for quite a while. But God sends Nathan to confront him. But I want you to see the critical thing here and to know what kind of man David really was at heart. We see in verse 13, 2 Samuel 12 verse 13. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. David sets the pattern for us. He sets the pattern for us of what to do when we're found in sin before a holy God. Be honest. Take responsibility. That's what David did. You know, David could have said, what? What are you talking about? That wasn't me. As God is my witness, that wasn't me. He, he could have made a, a hundred excuses. He was the king after all. He was the, he was the top man in the whole area there. He could have said whatever he wanted to say, and, and, and truthfully, uh, there wouldn't have been a man alive there in that area that could have challenged him because he was the king. No, Nathan, you're mistaken. It's not me. That was another person. I know who it is and I'll take care of it. But instead, what did David do? He said, I have sinned. He just became truthfully honest with God and took responsibility. And this clearly shows that when we Christians sin against God, it's, it must be our responsibility as well to, 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 to be truthful with God and, and allow God to put those sins away from us. Because that's what he did for David. Interestingly, David tells, or excuse me, Nathan tells David, thou, thou shall not die. Thou shall not die, he says. In the Old Testament, remember, God's judgment on sin was often immediate and usually resulted in either death or some other harsh consequence. So I'm sure that when David heard Nathan say, Thou shall not surely die, there probably was some sense of relief on David's part. He was a man, remember, just like you and I. David acknowledges his sin because God still wants to hear from our hearts. You know, when we sin, part of that confession is God wants to hear from us exactly what it is that we've done. And sometimes we just gloss it all over. You know what I did, God, and I'm sorry. But David shows us a pattern of Acknowledging his sin and spelling it out and because God still wants to hear from our hearts and he still wants to know and hear us acknowledge and have us uh, have him see that we realize and understand what it is we've done to offend a holy God. So the first thing we see in David's psalm here is confession. David confessed, verses 1 through 6. Secondly, look at Psalm 51 and verse 7. The Bible says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities, all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We see David's plea for restoration. He says, purge me with hyssop. David uh, understood and he asked the Lord to restore those privileges that he once had that were forfeited when he was in sin. Sin always costs us. Every time we do anything, there's some reaction. There's something that takes place. Every time we, we you know, I, I hear the politicians say all the time, well, you know, we ought to legalize drugs and marijuana and all the other stuff because after all, you know, it's a victimless crime, they'll say. Tell that to the folks who've been killed by drug dealers. Because they saw something they shouldn't see. Tell that to the person who's been robbed on the street and murdered senselessly because some drug addict needed a fix and needed money to buy his next batch of drugs. Don't tell me that drugs are a victimless crime. It's just simply a lie of the devil. But every time we sin, there's a cost. And sin in a Christian's life will not keep you out of heaven. But we lose fellowship with God when we sin and we don't confess and, and especially when our sin uh, deal uh, involves other people, it's even worse. David could in no way explain away his actions and the others that it affected with Bathsheba. He couldn't sit there and say, well, you know, after all, what's the big deal? I saw a woman. I took her. Her husband wasn't around. There was no one else around but her and I. And what's the big deal? He couldn't, couldn't do that. Because his actions caused a whole lot more people to be hurt and to be affected than just that. His sin with Bathsheba was not a victimless crime. It was a, it was a sin that was going to cost a man his life. It was going to cost a child their life. It was not something that was going to be swept under the rug so nobody would know about it. It affected a lot of folks. Now, not every sin that we commit is like that, but a lot of them are. Did you know if you come into the church house on a Sunday morning with unconfessed sin in your heart, you're not going to hear the things from God oftentimes that you need to hear. Because you're harboring something and you're, uh, you're, you're putting yourself in a place where your fellowship with God is broken and needs to be restored. That's why when we come to the church house, we ought to do business with God first before we even get here. And say, speak to me, Lord, so that I can hear uh, what your word is going to say to me today when I'm there and I hear the preaching and teaching from your word in Sunday school and in the preaching time. Lord, I come with anticipation because I know the things that I'm going to receive are things that I'm going to need. David said it this morning in his Sunday school lesson. Every time you come to the church house, God has something to say to us. So David, he... He couldn't explain away his actions. And you notice the hyssop was the instrument used to sprinkle the blood on the sacrifices on the altar. And we see that throughout the Old Testament in many places. David asked God to restore his joy. He said, let me feel the same joy and contentment that I once felt when I was in a right relationship with, with you, God. Uh, he said, I know I, I once had it because... When you saved me, it was a difference in my life. And, and I had uh, the joy of the Lord in my life. And he says in verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. One of the easiest things to spot is a Christian who's got a bunch of unconfessed sin in their life. Even if they think that they're hiding it from their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you can still spot it many times. Why is that? Because their countenance is usually off. 
Their spirit is not what it is when they're walking in fellowship and communion with the Lord. Their spirit is off when unconfessed sin is there. And we know that our spirit affects our countenance. We say, well, I can hide it. You can't always. There's nothing worse than a Christian out of fellowship with God. He's he's, he's no good to anyone. God gave us a new spirit the day we were saved and we're quickened into a new life in Christ. And when sin is there and it's not being dealt with properly, it affects us, it shows in our countenance, and uh, the things that we should be doing, we cannot do. And here's the best part that we need to understand and the most critical part. When we're like that, Satan loves it. Because when we're in sin and when we're not fessing up with our God Satan loves it and the best part is he knows we're not going to be telling anybody about God or the things of God when we're that way that's why he makes it such a process and such a, such a, a, a complex plan oftentimes to get us where he wants us he knows your weakness he knows my weakness and he knows what he can do to trip us up and when he gets us tripped up he wants us to stay down But we have to understand what David did. We've got to get up. We've got to get back up and we've got to tell the Lord that we're sorry and that we ask His forgiveness for what we've done and and have Him to uh, restore that right relationship that David said, restore in me that right relationship. Make me to hear joy and gladness once again, Father. Help me to get past this thing and move me down the road past this. And we have a promise from God that He will do that. So we ask ourselves, why in the world would we not take advantage of that? Because like David also said this morning in his Sunday school, it's almost like he was preaching my message this morning. We're stubborn. We are stubborn people much of the time. Come on. Your halos are tarnished this morning. We are stubborn folks. We don't like to admit when we've made a mistake. You know, it just comes from that old pride. But every one of us makes more mistakes than what we're willing to admit, including this preacher. So David not only prayed and asked the Lord and had confession, he asked for the Lord to restore uh, the, uh, the, uh, the joy of his salvation and all those things. And then number three in verse 11, David desires a restored relationship with his God. Notice verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David was basically saying, Lord, please... Please don't cast me away and not allow me to get back to the place that I once was with you. He said, Lord, you can do anything you want to me, but don't cast me away. I can't take it, Lord, if you cast me away. Don't do that. And he was begging for God's mercy to to be brought back into the sweet fellowship once again. He says, cast me not away from thy presence. He said, "Uh, just let me be near you. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David humbly asked God for the closeness he had once enjoyed. And he begs God never to leave him again. He longs for that Holy Spirit's presence to be ever present. You know, every one of us this morning are influencing somebody, somewhere. Each of us this morning has somebody in our life, in our circle of friends or our acquaintances, may not be a Christian, but every one of us has somebody that we are influencing somewhere. They're watching you. They're watching us. They're looking to see whether or not we're truly what we say and claim we are. And the truth of the matter is, we're either either going to be good in our actions or we're going to be evil in our actions. It's like we hear in politics, there's no middle of the road. Either you are or you aren't. You either say yay or you say nay. Nay. 
And God knows whether we're in His camp or we're not. And the people watching us are paying attention as well. And many times we can't lead somebody to Christ because they're watching us too closely and they see hypocrisy. We say one thing and we do something else. And David basically is saying, cast me not from thy presence. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When we were saved, God gave us some things. And it was he that gave. He didn't uh, rejuvenate some greatness in us when he saved us. You know, sometimes people think, well, when I got saved, you know, I had some pretty good gifts. And boy, the Lord just knew he needed me. (laughs) that's just a joke. God doesn't need any of us. He can do whatever He chooses to do with whoever He wants. Doesn't need our permission, doesn't need our help. God doesn't need any of us to do the things and accomplish the things that He wants to accomplish in this world going forward. The things that God is going to do are already set. We're just playing it out now. We're just following the Lord and waiting to see, and we're waiting for that blessed hope. I can't even imagine what it must have been like for David to have the terrible sin of someone's life on your conscience. Can you? David promises God that he will sing his praises once again as long as he is able. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with Thy free spirit. But notice what he says in verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. You know, every time we sin, there should always be an honest plea of confession. A desire for a a a relationship to be restored. And finally, a desire for a lasting relationship to continue. David says, restore in me. Because then I will lead, uh, uh, teach transgressors, I should say, uh, thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You know, notice David didn't say, you know, get me back to where I was so I can go live in my happy old merry way and do the things that I want to do. No, David says, if you'll, if you'll restore me, he said, I'll go back to work for you. And the truth is, every one of us that's here this morning, God saved you, not so that you could get a free pass out of the fiery furnace, But God saved you so that you could go to work for Him. Every one of us has a ministry this morning. Every one of us has been given at least one gift. And God wants us to be using that gift. Whether you have a gift, uh, excuse me, a gift of uh, of uh, of helps, a gift of uh, of uh, you know just uh, being a person who can pray and. Uh, being a person who can uh, uh, sing or has a a musical ability or whatever the gift is that God has given you, God wants us using it for His honor and His glory. I found this illustration that I thought was very good. It's not something that I wrote, but it's an illustration that I found I want to share with you. Edwin Cooper, how many of you know who Edwin Cooper was? Anybody? Edwin Cooper was Bozo the Clown. He was famous across America, and yet almost no one knew his real name. Coming from a family of circus clowns, Cooper began performing before audiences when he was just nine years old. After a stint with the Barnum and Bailey Circus, he became a fixture on television in the 1950s as Bozo the Clown. In addition to entertaining both young and old, Cooper had a message for his buddies and partners every week on the television. Get checked for cancer. Yet Cooper was so busy working that he neglected to follow his own advice. And by the time his cancer was discovered, it was too late for it to be treated. Edwin Cooper died at just 41 years of age from a disease he had warned many others to watch out for, for years. Sin is far more deadly than the most aggressive and fast-growing cancer. Sin kills and destroys everything it touches, from the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden until now. Sin takes no prisoners. 
This is the purpose behind everything Satan does. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Because of his evil nature and his hatred of everything good, the devil brings destruction to everything within his reach. And when we regard sin as God does, we find nothing amusing or humorous about it. We will not make it the subject of the jokes we tell or those we hear. We will not allow ourselves to be tempted to get a little closer to the line to see if we are still safe. God hates sin with a holy and righteous fury, and so, we, and so should we. When we find ourselves amused by sin, it is time for us to focus on the cross. Seeing the pride paid for our sin reminds us that it is no laughing matter. I thought that was very good. Let me just remind you as we close this morning. If we will practice these three examples that David gives us in Psalm 51. Whenever we're in sin, if we will come before God with an honest and truthful confession. We'll pray and ask God to restore a right spirit within us and a right relationship. I believe God will continue to use us. For his honor and for his glory. David was never the same man after his sin. But God still did use him. God used him in a lot of ways. But every time we sin and we don't go to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness. And we let it just sit there and fester. It just makes things worse. And so my challenge for you this morning is this. If we're in that place this morning. Don't put it off. Do business with God today. And go out into the afternoon on this beautiful day and thank God for His ability to be forgiven. He gives it to every one of us freely. And we ought to be exercising it every, time, every chance that we get. Let's just ask God to help us to be what we're supposed to be as we stand before Him one day at the judgment seat. Would you stand with me for prayer?